we look upon the walls of old Jerusalem, walls which have been destroyed and rebuilt many times. The land of Palestine is like the never-never land of fairy tales, because it never really existed. When the Romans committed genocide against the Jews in 70 AD, they promised it would be known as Palestine, a name derived from the Philistines of King David's day. This was just another way to degrade and humiliate the Jews. When Jews began to return home in large numbers in 1882, fewer than 250,000 Arabs lived there. Contrary to modern mythology, no independent Palestinian state ever existed. It was ruled alternately by Rome, by Islamic and Catholic Crusaders, by the Ottoman Empire, and by the British after World War I. After World War II, the British and the United Nations agreed to restore the land to the Jewish people as their homeland. Modern day Israel was not founded by war, but it was the cause of one. In the Six Day War, Israel captured Judea, Samaria, and East Jerusalem, but they didn't capture these territories from Yasser Arafat. They captured them from Jordan's King Hussein. In the same manner, Gaza was an Egyptian-controlled area. The refugees of Arab aggression are not the mythological Palestinians. That's historical revisionism. They are abandoned Jordanians, Egyptians, and Iraqis. The Arabs simply need to take responsibility for abandoning their own citizens and allow them to return home. Under Arab occupation, the land was arid desert. As Moses had prophesied, the land went desolate during the Diaspora. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it will be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. So we can see that Moses accurately predicted what would happen during the Jews' dispersion. In a surprising juxtaposition, Ezekiel prophesied over 2,000 years prior what would happen when the Jews returned to the land. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in sight of all who pass by. So they will say, this land that was desolate has become like a Garden of Eden. What was arid desert only a few decades ago is now fertile farmland. This prophecy's fulfillment was initiated in 1856 when a famous British Jew, Sir Moses Montefiore, purchased land outside of Jerusalem to teach agriculture to the Jews in the land. This influx of resources resulted in an economic upswing that attracted Arabs from surrounding countries. The Jews provided jobs for the Arabs and they peacefully coexisted. Now today, Israel is one of the few nations in the world that can feed itself. Israel produces 95% of its own food requirements. This is a modern day miracle as less than 10 nations in the world are capable of feeding themselves. And again, this is especially astounding considering that just a few decades ago, Israel was a desert. And way back in the 8th century BC, the prophet Isaiah foresaw this. In the days to come, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. What was once desert now yields apples, pears, peach, plum, apricot, sweet cherries, avocados, mangoes, bananas, persimmons, and lychees. Israel is listed as one of the top citrus fruit producers in the world and produces most of the grapefruits and small citrus fruits for the European Union. In Psalm 118, we are told, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. At the time of the building of Solomon's temple, all the stones for the temple were cut to shape at the quarry and were transported to the temple site. Jewish legend has it that one day, a stone that did not seem to fit the building arrived at the construction site. The builders set it aside and it was soon forgotten. Sometime later, the builders came to a place in the building where a special stone, a keystone or cornerstone, was required. They requested it from the stonecutters at the quarry, but were told that the stone they requested had already been sent up. Now, After a while, they realized their mistake, and the old, rejected stone was found. So the proverb, the stone the builders rejected, became the capstone, passed into the language. Now in Psalm 118, this proverb is quoted prophetically as a symbol of Jesus' coming, rejection, death, and resurrection. Jesus is the stone that the leaders of Israel refused. 
Yet, he has become the cornerstone of God's dispensation of grace. Now, the day of the recovery of the stone is the day of resurrection. Thus, this day, the day of resurrection, is the new day that the Lord has made, and in him all who know him as Savior shall rejoice and be glad in it. Now, we know this is the proper interpretation of Psalm 118 because it was the interpretation given to us by Peter when he spoke it before the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem after the Lord's resurrection. He said of Jesus, This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Skeptics of Christianity seem to enjoy pointing out that the majority of modern Jews do not recognize Jesus' fulfillment of over 300 Old Testament messianic prophecies cited by Christian scholars. Skeptics whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. The skeptics are spiritually blinded just as Israel is blind until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Rabbi Yitzhak Kaduri was one of the most prominent ultra-Orthodox rabbis. He devoted his life to study of the Torah and prayer on the behalf of the Jewish people. Now, when he died on January 28, 2006, at the remarkable age of 108, over 200,000 people attended his funeral. A few months before Kaduri died, he surprised his followers when he told them that he met the Messiah. Kaduri gave a message in his synagogue on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, teaching how to recognize the Messiah. A few months before he died, he wrote a small note which he requested should remain sealed for a year after his death. He mentioned to his disciples that the religious people would have a harder time accepting this particular person to be the Messiah than would non-religious people. As he requested, one year after his death, the note was made public. Now, translation of the actual quote means, He will lift the people and prove that his word and law are valid. The note was an acrostic, meaning that the first letter of each word in the sentence spells another word. The letters add up to the name Yeshua the Hebrew form of the name Jesus. Of course, we can now understand why he wanted them to wait for a year after his death to read it. This has sent a shockwave throughout the Jewish community, and many are trying to deny it. The book of Zechariah describes the establishment of the Messianic age in chapters 12 through 14. Now, chapter 13 describes the national cleansing of Israel from idolatry. Chapter 14 describes the coming of the Messiah, or the day of the Lord. But this is all preconditioned by chapter 12, which states, Now will pour out on the house of David and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve as one grieves for a firstborn. Yes, right there in the Tanakh, prophesied by Zechariah in the 6th century BC, God describes himself as the one they pierced. Now, this will occur during the tribulation period. Shortly before his crucifixion, Jesus said of this period of time, And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. For the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The purpose of this tribulation is that so that Israel will acknowledge their offense. Contrary to popular misrepresentations, the unforgivable sin spoken of by Jesus was unbelief and blasphemy of the Holy Spirit occurred when the Pharisees accused Jesus of working miracles by the power of demons. Way back in the 8th century BC, God spoke through the prophet Hosea describing the conditions of the arrival of the Messianic Kingdom. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction they will earnestly seek me. Now I don't know what modern Jews are thinking, but this is also in their Tanakh. Clearly, for one to return to their place, it is necessary that he left it. Only after having left it can he return to it. This implies that Messiah was necessarily already here and has returned to wait for acknowledgement. Now, for the second coming to occur, there are two conditions. Israel must confess their national sin of rejecting his Messiahship, and two, they must plea for his return. So to answer the question I proposed at the very beginning of this presentation, 
Why should Christians support Israel? You see, it's really not that Israel is the beacon of freedom and democracy in the otherwise totalitarian Islamic confederation in the Middle East. For Christians are also in favor of monarchy. The blessed hope is the coming of a king who will rule from Jerusalem, the king of kings and lord of lords. Yeshua. Yeshua. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God. When I am hallowed in you before their eyes, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 